Welcome to Liverton Kirk. Um, the church building here sits on a hill to the south of Edinburgh and from that hill you can see for miles. You can see right across the city, you can see right across the Firth of Forth to the north and even to the hills of Fife beyond. Um, we think that uh, there has been a church building on this site for hundreds and hundreds of years. In fact, two ancient Celtic crosses were discovered in this area, not far from the, this current building. Um, and, and we believe they are dated from anywhere between the 8th and the 11th century. Um, they, they can, they're actually situated now in the National Museum of Scotland. They're on display there. But we've taken the, the, the pattern from those crosses and we've used it for our church logo. And you can see that logo as you go through the glass doors of the church. This present building was designed by James Gillespie Graham, a famous architect. In fact, an architect who was responsible for quite a few of the buildings in Newtown in Edinburgh. Um, the, the church, was, which is quite an attractive church, it's situated on a hill, it's floodlit at night, it can be seen from miles around, and it's particularly attractive in the autumn because by the autumn, this lovely Virginia creeper has turned red and photographers come from miles around to take its photograph. Our church building here is actually the centre of a vibrant, worshipping Christian community. And we'd love to invite you inside. In fact, Please come in now and Chris Brandy will start the tour. Welcome to our lovely church. Perhaps the layout of the interior of the church is unexpected. Instead of the pulpit and communion table being situated at the east end of the church, they are in the middle of the south wall. The pews and the gallery surround them on three sides. This design is typical of many old post-Reformation churches in Scotland. Churches became centred on the Word of God as preached from the pulpit. Today, most preaching is done from the platform, but if you come up the steps to the pulpit, you will see that the minister can be seen from and can see every seat in the church. The hanging on the front of the pulpit, called the pulpit fall, is changed according to the season of the Christian year or for special occasions. The one on the pulpit today celebrates all things bright and beautiful. The Lord God made them all. The walls behind have banners made by our banner group. The ones here today depict words from the Old and New Testament. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, from Psalm 150. And Jesus' words, I am the way and the truth and the life, from John 14. On the north wall, you will find four embroidered panels made to celebrate the millennium. These are on the theme of the journey and are entitled Creation, Civilization, Destruction and the Promise. The two panels of handmade felt on the side walls were added more recently. If we return to the west door, where we came in, you will see our two war memorials, just to the right of the door. As we come through this door on the north side of the church, we enter the vestry. On the walls, there are some historical items. The first recorded evidence of a church here is the Great Charter of Holyrood, signed in 1143, which refers to a chapel at Liberton, which had belonged to the parish of St Cuthbert, being granted by King David I to the Abbey of Holyrood. The present church was built in 1815 to replace a much older building. 
sketch of the old church by Andrew Kerr shows a building consisting of a tower, first topped with wood and later with stone, and a centre aisle. Several side aisles and galleries, each with its own outside stone stair, were added to the main body of the church in the 17th and 18th centuries by various landowning families. The foundation stone of the present building was laid on 27th of January 1815. The date of the actual opening and dedication of the new building remains unknown. There were arguments between the local landowners, known as heritors, about the seating arrangements in the church for their families and workers. This meant the church could not be opened for services until all the seats had been allocated and numbered, which probably caused much embarrassment. I am now going to hand over to Helen, one of the young people in our congregation. If we go up the stairs, we reach the gallery. The church was altered in 1882 at a cost of £1,200 by reducing the size of the gallery. It was thought the gallery was too dark and too near the roof. This reduced the number of seats in the church from 1,480 to 1,000, so the seats had to be reallocated to the local landowners. The plan displayed here shows the new seating allocations made in 1882. It includes family names we recognise from local streets, for example, Little and Gilmore. There have been more changes to the church since then. In 1958, the seating was reduced again to about 900 to create more space around the communion table. During the latest refurbishment in 2006, some pews were removed from the southeast and southwest corners and new aisles cut to create more space. The church can now seat around 720 people. At that refurbishment, the platform was opened up to be more accessible and flexible. The stained glass window was given in memory of Major General Andrew Gilbert Wachup of Nidre, an elder of Liberton Kirk. He was killed in December 1899 in the Boer War, leading the Highland Brigade at Magersfontein, South Africa. The subject of the window is taken from Acts chapter 10, the angel appearing to Cornelius, the good centurion. The window cost £135 and was availed on the 8th of June 1905 by Lieutenant Colonel R.G. Gordon Gilmore of Liberton and Craig Miller. If we walk down the stairs at this side of the gallery, we can come to the elders' room. This is close to the site of the Baird burial vault in the previous church and has many memorials to the Baird family. There are pictures of ministers over the last two centuries and some information about them. Reverend James Begg, who was minister at Liberton Kirk from 1834 to 1843, is particularly noteworthy. He was an influential leader of the anti-patronage party and left the established Church of Scotland at the disruption of 1843. He then became minister in the Free Church of Scotland at Newington Free Church, later renamed St Paul's Newington. The pewter plate displayed here, which was used for collections for the poor of the parish, dates from the 17th century. The elders' room is used for prayer and for counting the church offering. Now I'm going to hand you back to Chris. As we return to the main part of the church, you will see the church organ. This is a wyvern organ, which was installed in 2001. The history of installing an organ in Liberton Kirk is a long and difficult one. It was not until 1890 that a harmonium was used in services. In 1907, an organ committee was formed by the congregation to take steps to introduce a pipe organ into the church. There were so many difficulties that it took until 1930 before an Ingram pipe organ was installed. As we go towards the east door, 
you can see two beautifully embroidered pulpit falls for Holy Week and Pentecost displayed in these cases. There is a book of remembrance here where names of loved ones who have died are inscribed. This is a quiet corner of the church, which is often used for prayer. We're now returning to the kirkyard to have a look at some of the places of interest. Outside the church, on the south wall, there is a memorial to Reverend James Grant, the minister when the new kirk was built in 1815. The stone is very worn, but the wording is shown on a plaque on the railings in front of the memorial. From here, we can see the church gates and the offering house, which were built in 1818. The offering house is so called because offerings for the poor were received here when collection of money was not permitted in the church. The General Assembly of the Church of Scotland passed an act in 1648 forbidding the collection of money during church services, which it said was a very great and unseemly disturbance of divine worship. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, body snatchers or resurrectionists who stole freshly buried corpses for sale to medical schools were a serious problem in Scotland. The most well-known of these were Burke and Hare, who committed a series of murders in Edinburgh between 1827 and 1828 to provide surgeons with yet more bodies. The offering house at Liberton would have served the purpose of a watch house accommodating a night watchman to keep guard over newly interred burials. From the gates, you can see our Kirk Centre across the road, which has a number of halls and the Kirk Gate Cafe. It is well used by church and community. Liberton Kirkyard is in the care of the City Council as is the neighbouring Liberton Cemetery. The kirkyard has over 200 gravestones, all dating before 1855. The gravestone next to the gate includes dates as far back as 1665. Close to this is the Highland Porter's Stone. This dates from the middle of the 18th century and is unusual in this area of Scotland, as it shows men in Highland dress. There is a gravestone depicting a green man. This is often regarded as a pagan symbol of fertility, but green men occurred regularly in Christian graveyards throughout Europe. A small anonymous stone bears the caption a man is best known when he is dead. Other inscriptions offer advice, such as tack tent lest time be tent, take care lest time be lost, and thole and think on, endure and reflect. The farmer's stone near the gate to Liberton Cemetery is a table stone dating from 1753. It shows a ploughing scene from the village of Straton with the Pentland Hills in the background and gives a rare depiction of an old Scots plough pulled by both horses and oxen. The grave of the longest serving minister, John Stuart, is against the manse wall just behind the northwest corner of the church. He died in 1879 at the age of 87, having served the ministry for 57 years. 
Finally, the church tower was built on the foundations of the tower of the previous church on this site. Some of the older memorials were moved and placed inside the new tower. There is no access to the tower from the church itself. The spire of the old church was struck by lightning in August 1744 and presumably the bell was damaged. A new bell was installed in 1747 made by Henderson and Ormiston. The bell was rung an hour before the service to alert farm workers in time to finish their work and dress for church. The bell was incorporated in the new church, so it is older than the church itself. It is still rung before Sunday services, but not an hour ahead. Now, back to our minister. So, thank you so much for coming to visit us here at Liberton Kirk. We have a beautiful building, we love our building, but we're also very conscious that church is far, far more than a building. And on the bicentenary of the, the laying of the foundation stones of this building behind me, um, we erected a cairn. Here it is. And it's a cairn, it's in the southwest corner, and it's commemorating all the living stones, all the people, past, present, future, who make up our church. You would be very welcome to join us any day of the week, or on a Sunday at our times of worship, or even on Zoom. Um, or you could just pop into our cafe and have some refreshment.